Hi, Fabal is here today to talk to you about Horace's Ode 3.1. Before I begin with the more exegetical portion of this presentation, I would like to read part of the poem in meter. O di profanum, vulgus et archio, fawete linguis carmina non prius, audita musarum sacerdos, virginibus puerisque canto, Regum timendor in proprios greges, reges in ipsos imperiumst, iovis pleri giganti o triumpho, puncta super moentis. Est ut we row latius ordinet arbus da socis hic generosio descendat in campum petitor moribus hic melior que fama content Turba clientium, seed maiore qua lege necessitas, sorti turin signis et imos, omne capax moeturna nomen, de strictus sensis, qui superintia, Ser we capendet non secula da pes doge laboratum saporum non avium kitharae que cantus somnum reducent somnus agrestium. Lanis we rorum, non humilis domos, fastidi dombro sanque ripam, non zeferis agitata tempe. For the sake of time, I'm going to forgo the reading of the rest of the poem and instead move right to the translation. I hate and I spurn the profane crowd. Avoid words of ill omen. I, priest of the muses, sing songs not heard before by virgins and boys. The power over the personal flocks of the kings to be feared, and over the kings themselves, is Jove's, famous in the triumph of the giants, moving all things with an eyebrow. It is so that a man arranges the plantation more widely in furrows than a man. This one may descend as a nobler candidate into the campus martius, this man might contend better with respect to character and reputation. There may be a greater crowd of clients to that man. With equal law, necessity casts lots over the distinguished men and the lowest men. The spacious urn moves every name. For whom the unsheathed sword hangs above the impious neck, Sicilian banquets will not develop a sweet taste. The songs of birds and of the lyre do not bring back sleep. Gentle sleep does not scorn the humble houses of rural men. And the shady shore, not the tempe, agitated by the zephyrs, the tumultuous sea does not rouse the one desiring what is enough, nor the savage attack of falling Arcturus or of rising Hydus. Not the vineyards beaten with hail and the mendacious farm, now with the tree blaming the waters, now the stars scorching the fields, now the treacherous winters. The fishes sense the waters narrowed by the massive structures thrown into the deep, to hear the constant contractor lets down small stones with servants and the disdainful lord of the land. But fear and threats ascend to that same place where the master climbs, and black care does not depart with the trireme made of bronze, and he sits behind the horseman. But if neither the Phrygian stone nor the use of purples clearer than a star soothe the one grieving, nor Falernian wine and the Persian aromatic plant, 
Why should I labor at a sublime atrium with doorposts to be envied and a new style? Why should I receive the toilsome riches in exchange for the Sabine vow? So what does all this mean? Why is Ode 3.1 so special? Well, for one thing, 3.1 is one of the longest odes in Horace's oeuvre, coming in at a whopping 48 lines. Not only is it beautifully arranged and well-worded, Ode 3.1, like much of Horace's work, is very didactic in nature. For that reason, it retains much of the aesthetic value for which it would have been appreciated in its own time. Before I talk about that, however, I would like to give a little context to the poem. It was previously believed that the first stanza of Ode 3.1 was added to the poem as an introduction to what are called the Roman Odes, which are the first six odes in Book 3. Although Horace never called them the Roman Odes, or even makes reference to them as a collection, these first six poems of Book 3 are often grouped together because of their similar subject matter, solemn style, and shared meter, the alcaic meter. However, as classicist Reimer Faber points out in his article, Poetics of Closure in Horace Odes 3.1, this notion was laid to rest long ago. Instead, he finds a deep and meaningful connection between the first stanza of the ode and the final stanza. He writes, quote, the image of building a lofty atrium in the latest style recalls the picture of the ambitious and wealthy home builder of lines 33 through 40, but, as it does not apply literally to the poet portrayed in this poem as priest of the muses, it begs figurative interpretation, end quote. Therefore, what seems like a disconnect between the first and final stanza is actually a result of Horace's brilliant ability to flow back and forth between the figurative and the literal which famed Latin scholar Steele Commager notes as, quote, the most distinctive element of his verse, end quote. Another important thing one must understand before reading this poem is the story of the sword of Damocles, to which Horace makes reference. Damocles, courtier in the court of Dionysus II of Syracuse, tells Dionysus how fortunate he is to be king in an attempt to flatter him. Dionysus offers to switch places with Damocles, who eagerly accepts, However, Dionysus arranges for there to be a massive sword hung over his head, held up only by a single horse's hair, in order to convey the constant fear that accompanies the power of such a man. When Horace mentions the unsheathed sword in line 17, he is referring to this story. All right, well, now that you have some background on this ode, let me get right into the analysis. Like the famous Ode 2.10, which advocates for the Orium Mediocritatem, the golden mean, Ode 3.1 urges the reader not to be overly ambitious. In the poem, he sets up a major contrast between the man who is probably too ambitious and he who is more reasonable and desires only what he needs. Horace says that the more ambitious man may be nobler, may have a nicer plantation, a greater crowd of clients, etc. However, the unsheathed sword, which is of course the sword of Damocles, will hang forever above his impious neck. Therefore, all the riches that he has heaped up in his life will be impossible to enjoy, because instead of pleasure, they just cause anxiety. For example, Horace says the banquets will not taste sweet, and sleep will not relieve him, since he is so stressed out as fear and threats ascend to the same place as he. And what's worse is that the Phrygian stone, nor the use of purples clearer than a star, nor Falernian wine, and the Persian aromatic plant, all things that are examples of these riches that these men have acquired, cannot soothe a grieving heart. On the other hand, he who chooses to live a modest life, seeking just as much as he needs, will have a relaxed life. He will not be perturbed by the tumultuous sea, falling Arcturus, rising Hydus, or hail-beaten vineyards, etc. Unlike a man of power or wealth, he will not have the unsheathed sword of worry and angst constantly hanging over his head. As he says in Ode 1.38, the simple things are enough for him. That is why Horace asks why he would ever trade his Sabine farm, which, as Faber points out, represents modest financial means, a private life, and composition of personal lyric poetry, for any toilsome riches. The terribly cynical saying goes, whoever dies with the most toys wins. In this Ode, Horace shows that these quote-unquote toys, the advantages that the various people in the poem think they have, come out to nothing in the end. We are all subject to necessity, and there is no escaping death, so it is best to sit back on our Sabine farm, cultivate our garden, and enjoy life while we can.